Since the beginning of time, human beings have been using art to express those things that are not easily expressed. And since the beginning of time, art has been leading people towards the divine. Today we go to the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto for a once-in-a-lifetime exhibition. We think of mysticism as being quiet, being silent, not having images, but in fact, this kind of contemplation is an attempt to put you in the story. Father Gilles Mongeau is a Jesuit priest and an associate professor of systematic theology at Toronto's Jesuit Regis College. As a theologian, he was invited to be part of the advisory committee for the exhibit titled Mystical Landscapes. Between the 1890s and the period shortly after the First World War, artists are struggling to discover a way of opening up to people uh, a new dimension of reality that, that the materialism and the um, techno technocracy of the end of the 19th century is not the final word and that all the injustices, all of the difficulties that are springing from this materialism can be remedied if people would turn to a, a depth dimension in their lives. And so, in various ways, the, the artists in the exhibit are trying to bring that deeper dimension of reality to life. But they're doing it out of their own experience of that deeper reality. The mystic way goes through light and dark phases, alternately. And so, there was the idea of, of alternating light and dark, both metaphorically in the works, and in our, our color scheme and our lighting, so that you'd feel as if you were actually going through different uh, emotional, spiritual states. Desolation, consolation. He brings it all together and he gets his own feelings into it. Catherine Lochnan was curator at the Art Gallery of Ontario and taking a course on integration for ministry at Regis College when she had the idea for the show. I thought I was going to retire. Uh, but my classmates uh, thought otherwise. Um, I became very interested in the Ministry of Spiritual Direction and I thought I'd like to go on in that course. Um, and they said, well, you'd be good at that, but you're already in your ministry and it's curating and you still have something else to do. And everyone felt this, my classmates, my teacher Maureen McDonnell. And so I thought, well, perhaps I should just wait before I retire and see whether another idea comes up. And within a very short period of time, thanks to a walk through the Metropolitan Museum, 19th century painting galleries, I had the idea for this show. Well, I never thought of curating as a ministry, uh, but they did. They identified it as a ministry. And I guess that the results of this exhibition prove to be correct. When you enter the exhibit, the audio tour invites you to join in a voyage of discovery into the infinite mysteries of nature and the cosmos. The visitors are then guided through various works of art by artists from Europe, Scandinavia and North America, including Monet, Van Gogh, Paul Gauguin, Emily Carr, Lauren Harris, Georgia O'Keeffe and Eugene Janssen. Janssen was known as the blue painter in Stockholm. We see the contemplative landscape, uh, a, a kind of landscape which invites us, the viewer, right into this beautiful empty blue ground. The artist has constructed the picture in such a way that he's used multiple viewpoints and we feel as if we're actually lifted up and floating over this body of water towards the city of God. What's interesting about this composition is that that empty space of water in the center is an image of depth. It's not just an obstacle, it's actually uh, an invitation to go deep. What's important about the city on the other side of that expanse of water is, is the verticals. So you see how the steeples have become what we see in some of the other painters, 
in the trees. Tall verticals are ways of communication between heaven and earth. And in this particular case, the trees have become the steeples. And each of the steeples is elongated, right, into the water. So there's that sense of being sent down into the depths, but also being raised up to the heights through these verticals. The center steeple is very, very important because if you look at the sky, you'll see that the entire sky is revolving around that center steeple. It's called the axis mundi, the pole of the world, the center vertical around which the whole world revolves. He wants us to think of this urban image as the city of God. All of this as the dawn rises, which of course is an Easter image. When you paint, some motif will capture your imagination and you then try and capture that. You don't spend a lot of time analyzing the, the meaning of the motif. Um, you just know that it's speak, speaking to you. Yeah. And you're often uh, invited to select some aspect of it yeah. to, f to make your focal point. And so artists learn how to work from intuition. They don't set out to paint a mystical landscape. Yeah. Another artist featured in the exhibit is a 19th century French painter who is described as the most mystical artist of his generation, Charles Marie Dulac. During the last eight years of his life, while living in a Franciscan friary, he illustrated a series of panels titled after St. Francis of Assisi's The Canticle of the Creatures. Very dramatic, Brother Wind. And so, what, and he names this after the Holy Spirit. So he has this darkness, but this illumination in the sky. But there's an incredible movement here. And if you go to the, the, the text of the canticle, he talks about the wind that gives sustenance to us. And he's even put a little bit of architectural piece here. Yeah. to solidify yeah. its grounding. And Francis also says, in all kinds of weather, talking about the wind. So this is a, a stormy moment, but there's a light in it also. There's... Brother Ignatius Fever is a Franciscan friar and a retired religion teacher. He is also an amateur artist. Catherine Lochnan invited him to interpret Dulac's portfolio of the Canticle of Creatures. He saw a meeting of the two souls. Francis, who loved creation, saw the divine in creation, and the very thing that caught the heart of Dulac. So he found a soulmate in Francis. And so he lived for eight years after that and died quite young in his 33rd year. Everything that is in this gallery that we have here was done while he was dying. Everything that Dulac did post-conversion is an expression of his prayer. He never really painted on sight or drew on sight. He just sat in contemplation of what was before him. And then when he came back to his studio, what had settled in his inner being was then expressed. So really what we see is an expression of his prayer. It is the intention of Dulac is to invite the viewer to also have a, a prayer experience, a meditative, contemplative experience. I really do love this canticle of creatures, particularly the one where you see, not typically of Dulac, of, of, of image in the painting, where you see this houseboat and uh, there's a woman dipping her, her beaker into the water. And that's from the Canticle of Creatures, which is Sister Water, Brother Fire. And so Dulac images that in the quiet of the evening, the stillness. The, the woman is dipping the beaker into the water. And through just the crack of the door, you see the light. So that's Brother Fire inside there. I, I could spend hours in front of that. It's just, it soothes the soul. It's good that we're standing with the Dulacs around us because Dulac 
deliberately painted landscape and not so-called sacred art because he felt that God made himself manifest through the creation and nature is that creation. And um, so the concept of landscape as created by God is an ancient one in the history of art. Um, but it becomes very important at the time of the Reformation when uh, iconoclasm uh, uh, led to the destruction of so much narrative religious art. Um, because in, um, in Protestant religions, um, landscape painting, notably in Holland, began to take the place of religious, overtly religious painting. But the landscape became a metaphor for the spiritual journey. But even Dulac would not be described as a religious artist, perhaps not even as a spiritual artist. Still, all of these artists are being described as mystics. Their art is a means to connect the viewer to a deeper reality. Certainly for many of the artists in the exhi exhibition, their religious background plays a role. You know, Van Gogh was the son of a Protestant minister. Uh, Gauguin went to seminary and in fact had been exposed to Ignatian spirituality in his youth. Uh, Janssen also from a Protestant family. So, so religion plays a role in the lives of many of these people, but they're not necessarily themselves as adults explicitly members of churches. So someone like Monet, for example, baptized Catholic, but really rediscovers this depth dimension that he's looking for in his conversation with Buddhism. So some are, I would say, explicitly religious. Dulac, we're in the Dulac room. He definitely is committed to being Catholic, so would Maurice Denis. But others are using the vocabulary they know some of our mystics are Catholic, some are Lutheran, some are atheist. It doesn't matter. They've had experiences of unity or of illumination. Those are two of the states on the mystic journey, mystic way, which have been transformative for them. And as mystics, having had mystical experiences, they want to convey them. And their medium is art. Spirituality is a very broad term. It can cover not just different traditions of prayer, it can cover devotional life, it can cover asceticism, it can cover a whole bunch of realities, including mysticism. Generally in the Catholic tradition, we, th we tend to restrict the word mysticism to that path that leads to communion with God, as opposed to all the other things that, that are very good, but don't have that specific goal in mind that kind of static notion of you know, knowing who we all were and where we stood in, in light of the divine. Um, it's now about experience. It's now about feeling. And all of those things have been marginalized by our secular culture, those soft skills. Um, but that's exactly what we need to reclaim as human beings. And so art, music, and poetry will encourage people to come come to, the, to that part of themselves that responds, the spiritual and emotional part. And so we feel that that's what's happening here. People from every culture and faith tradition, and, and I can speak for my atheist friends, are finding this a very powerful experience. In the exhibition, we follow the lead of Evelyn Underhill, uh, who is a late 19th century English theologian uh, of spirituality and that idea of the depth dimension really is the best way to capture what she is trying to show. It is possible to have a connection with the divine, uh, that that connection follows a certain path which we try to kind of model in the, in the pathway through the exhibit um, and that that path leads to communion with that deeper reality, the divine, God, each of the artists, you know, one of them, some will be Buddhist, some will define it differently, but it is that, that communion with the divine is the goal. Mysticism is a very difficult uh, word, of course, to define, but basically it's about seeing through rather than looking at. 
in the context of an art exhibition that looks at things mystical, the subject matter is metaphoric or symbolic. So these are not about views of the Tiber Valley or views of Stockholm. They're really about what those views evoke in the viewer. The overtly religious painting seems to be devoid of mystical feeling. The more literal religious painting is, the less spiritually um, evocative it is. Certainly these works of art are about more than just asking the question. Van Gogh was very clear in his correspondence that he saw his paintings as sermons. So he's doing more than asking questions. He is, in some sense, even if it's not explicitly Christian, he is evangelizing. He's trying to show a way. Uh, he's not just saying, oh, isn't this interesting? Would you consider it? He's saying, look, here's something really important that I want you to wrestle with and struggle with. Uh, and here's a way to, towards that. The numbers coming to this exhibition are record-breaking for us. And the feedback is proving our hypothesis correct. That these pictures have the power to touch people's lives and transform them. Because of the success of the exhibit, the theologians, the art historians, Father Gilles, Brother Ignatius, and Kathy want to build on it by creating more opportunities for what they are calling Visio Divina. We are now talking about developing a course at Regis College, which will take this exhibition as its base and keep moving forward, doing more research, following up on the feedback we're getting, and as well as other programs, because the Visio Divina has proven to be so successful and we have a waiting list. And we now have this wonderful um, team of theologians in different colleges who, who are all keen to keep working together. So um, we're going to just recommend that anyone that's really interested goes to the Regis College website, www.regiscollege.ca, um, and uh, keeps an eye out for course offerings and program offerings that will grow out of this because we feel the Spirit's moving here. Just as Lexio Divina, Divine Reading, is praying and meditating on Scripture, Visio Divina, or Divine Seeing, is praying with images. The Art Gallery of Ontario describes this practice as an invitation to look at art objects with a contemplative gaze, to look with an open heart and mind. It adds that, beyond first impressions, judgments, or understandings, Visio Divina helps to build an awareness of the deeper feelings, emotions, and thoughts provoked by a work of art. I think one of the most important things we as Catholics, as Christians, can learn from an exhibit like this is that we, we can think of culture, and particularly of art, as a place of dialogue, as a place really of constructive encounter with the world. Uh, very often now the narrative of the new evangelization can tend to become we have to bring something to the world uh, that's lacking. But artists like this are showing us that not only are people looking for the spiritual, but there are ways of finding it that we can affirm and develop. And, and that can only happen if we allow what's happening out there in culture to inform us and, and maybe even uh, uh, enlighten us about where the quest is. I never come in here without feeling that I'm entering a holy space. I'm very visual. I think visually. This whole exercise has been an outgrowth of the spiritual direction program. I thought if I could be a spiritual director, which I've had the experience of doing, and walk with a directee, and help them find their way forward, discern where they're going in their life journey. Why not take that same uh, practice and allow the artist to become the spiritual director and the viewer to become the directee and go with the artist on his or her journey and see what that work of art tells you about where you're at yourself. So that is Visio Divina. Um, it is um, an ancient form of contemplative prayer uh, used originally with icons in a preliterate age. 
I've always felt that art was, not all art, but m much art was a form of devotion, of prayer. My husband died six months ago, um, just as this was coming to fruition. Um, and I felt coming in here um, a tremendous sense of consolation. Um, it's been very difficult, but I do believe that these pictures have the power to heal and inspire. What happens to people from the moment they walk in as they go through the rooms, they become incredibly still. And, and the level of conversation at the beginning of the exhibit and the level of conversation at the end of the exhibit, it's night and day. People have become recollected and, and something has moved them and they come back. I have a friend, a non-believing friend, who's come back 25 times. You know, it's become a place of prayer for her. We really can learn something here about our dialogue with the world and with, with, with people. You know, I've done a little bit of reading around, you know, famous artists, and almost every one of them speaks about art as being a searching for God. In other words, a great art comes from the, that deeper inner place within ourselves that searches. Emily Carr said that. She said, you know, to all great art, she said, is a search for God. And to walk into the, the rainforest is to walk into God's tabernacle, you know. So when you look around this room, you see that. <laughs> you know, the artist is walking in to God's tabernacle, which is the divine in creation. So it doesn't matter what your tradition is, it doesn't matter what your differences are. Art, music, and poetry, as he sees it, have the power to bring everybody together around the spiritual journey. Nineteenth-century English writer Evelyn Underhill defined mysticism as the art of union with reality. And this is what these works of art do. They are a dialogue with reality, with the world, and with God. Underhill also said that contemplation is the mystic's medium. I think we can say with a certainty that contemplation is also the artist's medium, and that is why art has the power to heal. That is why art is a place of prayer. That is why art is a search for God. Today we were at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto looking at mystical landscapes. If you have any questions or comments about anything that you heard on this program or any of our programs, write to us, focus at saltandlighttv.org or contact us via social media at Salt and Light TV. Thank you for being with us and we'll see you next time on Catholic Focus.